Hey everyone, Pete Calandra here. This is a review video for class nine of the film scoring course I teach at the Copeland School of Music, Queens College, City University of New York. And this is for the fall 2021 semester. What I've posted here today is the first half of the class. If you'd like to see the second half of the class, within a couple of days of launching this, I'll have a link for that uh, so that you can watch that off of YouTube. I've got some copywritten material in there and I don't want to get this video blocked. In the video that you'll see today, I take the students through setting up Sibelius to score a film, how to import the video, how to uh, set up the frame rate, and how to set up your hit points. I typically don't score in Sibelius and I don't know any professional film composers who score in a notation program. but since some of the students only know how to use a notation software, I thought it was important to show that. Then, in the second half of this, I start to score the film in Pro Tools, which is my DAW. And the points that I teach here are relevant for any DAW. So the video is imported, I set up my timeline with markers, and then I show the effect of setting up the click track in three different tempos and how those tempos affect the feel of the music. So we just watch the film with the click track at 60 and then at 90 and then 120 beats per minute. Then I sit there and I improvise some music to those three different tempos so you can get a sense of how that feels. And then finally, I choose a tempo and score the first half of the film just to show my work methods to the students. Anyway, if you like this video, give a thumbs up. For more content, please subscribe, and to be notified, ring that bell. Also, leave any comments or questions down below. Thanks so much for watching, and let's get right into it. So let's take care of a little business first. Um, so today is October 27th. We're gonna have, we're gonna have two more assignments for the semester, all right? I'm going to assign something today that's going to be due on the 10th. And then I'm going to assign something due on the 10th. On, I'm going to assign something on the 10th, which is your final, which you'll have a month to do. You'll have to hand in a, a, um, a draft. And then I'm debating now. The last class is on the 8th. So it's either going to be due on the 8th or the 15th, which would be five weeks. So... But that's the basic gist of the rest of the semester. So we're, you know, we're way along into the semester. So there's going to be a, your first film that you're going to be scoring, which will be due two weeks from today. And then the final will be your second film that you'll be scoring. And I've got six or seven clips from actual real Hollywood movies that I've had set up for, for the class. So there's stuff... Um, I've got something from Save, Saving Private Ryan. Lee, your uh, mic is on. I'm sorry. Um, I've got clips from some Harry Potter movies, some Pixar stuff. So you'll you'll pick one of those clips and you'll score it for the rest, for your final. So um, yeah, and then during all the classes, we'll be going over more concepts, more techniques. We'll be analyzing more film music, and hopefully that'll be informing you. And if you've got any questions, you'll bring them up in class, and then I can present material to sort of, you know, help you along with that. Um, now, the uh, assignment I gave out was probably a little bit more difficult than maybe it, sh it should have been a two-week assignment, but I just wanted to throw you in the deep end of the pool and see how it would work for you. So what I did was um, I made a little drawing, which I think will help to explain some of the concepts of timing a little bit better. So let's take a look on the screen here. And that's this PDF that's in the chat. Let's move this over here. We don't need this right now. And let's make this bigger. All right. So timing, right? If we look here on this middle line here, I've got frames. So every second starts at zero, zero. So this is 24 frames, and this is one second of time from the beginning, from here to here, right? One second of time. Now, 
a quarter note and we're at 60 beats per minute and we're at 24 frames per second, just like I explained last week, okay? So a quarter note would be one quarter note per second and one quarter note per second of film or 24 frames per quarter note. An eighth note would be two eighth notes in one second or two eighth notes in 24 frames or 12 frames per eighth note. All right, so the first eighth note starts on zero, zero. The second eighth note of every beat, and this is, we're talking like if we're in four, four here, all right? <clears throat> the second eighth note of every beat starts on frame 12. Now, eighth note triplets. There are three eighth note triplets in every beat, right? So they are eight frames per beat, per, per note, per beat, right? So that starts on zero, eight, and uh, 16. And that's this line here. Sixteenth notes, there are four of them per second. There are four of them in 24 frames, or there are six frames per 16th note. So they starts on 0, 6, 12, and 18. Okay? Now, if we look at a DAW, a DAW breaks down the subdivisions of a beat into ticks. That's just what it's called. And Pro Tools has 960 ticks per eighth note, per, per quarter note. And there are uh, the, some of the other DAWs, you can change the resolution to an insane amount, but 960 ticks per quarter note is a very good resolution. So an eighth note takes up 480 ticks, right? So our second eighth note occurs on our 12th frame and it occurs on tick 480. Our 16th notes are 240 ticks. So the second 16th note is at tick 240 or frame six. The third, the, the, right? So the third 16th note occurs at the same time as the second eighth note or at tick 480. And the fourth 16th note occurs at tick 620 or frame 18. So frame zero is the first 16th note, frame six is the second 16th note, frame 12 is the third 16th note, and frame 18 is the fourth 16th note. Now, eighth note triplets. There are three triplets, right, as we said before, per beat, and so that means that the sec the, the, there are eight frames, right, per triplet. But as far as ticks goes, 960 divided by three is 320. So the first eighth note occurs on tick zero, zero, zero. The second eighth note triplet per beat occurs on 300, tick 320 or frame eight. And the third triplet occurs on tick 640 or frame uh, 16. All right, so this should help you visualize that a little bit more. One thing we didn't do last week was we didn't look at to how to set up a film inside of something like Sibelius. Now, what I would say that you're gonna have to do for this project is you're gonna have to figure out a software. This is not gonna be like a piano piece that you sit there with your phone and capture this piece you've written. You're gonna have to do some work inside of a DAW or inside of a notation software. So if you, you are familiar with notation software, that's perfectly fine. You won't get things that sound as good as they would with a DAW, but you'll get something that's perfectly acceptable and you can learn all the techniques. But to, to learn, to really be professional at film scoring, you have to learn a DAW. That's Logic, Cubase, Digital Performer, um, and Pro Tools. Those are the four best ones for scoring films. Not in that order, just those four. I think Cubase is the all-around most uh, advanced 
DAW and Digital Performer is very, very good for scoring films. It's got some features that are really, really, really uh, help scoring films and Logic is great at scoring films and Pro Tools works very well for scoring films. Um, so any of those four are, are perfectly fine, whichever floats your boat. You can even score films in GarageBand. So, okay, so I've got Sibelius here set up. Now, if you go to the, if you go to the play tab, you don't need to see me. If you go to the play tab, you notice right here, there's something for video. So if you click on this, Add video, and then I'm going to navigate to Loving Vincent Trailer, added it, and there it is inside of Sibelius. Now, with Pro Tools, you can cl click on this and resize this, or right click on this and resize this. In Sibelius, like that doesn't really work, but you got that right there. And then when you click on that, you can make um, hit points. But I'm going to show you a be better way to make hit points. So you can't really make this incredibly small, uh, which is you guys are going to be working on laptops. It's a bit of an issue. So what you need to do is to set up your time code. So if you click here on where it says time code, so I'm still on the play tab. I'm going to click on time code, right? The time code of the first bar, it, whatever it is so um, it's we know that from last week that it's all zeros for this one so that's set up and then you know the units right here you have to select frames and then make sure that 24 is set and this has all of the standardized right frame rates doesn't have every frame rate known to man but it's got 24 it's got 23.97 or drop 24 it's got 25 which is British television and then it's I mean British films and then it's got uh, 30 non drop 2997 drop and 2997 non drop then you can choose where to show the time code so if you say none and you click this there's no time code if you go back here and it's above every bar it's like that now that's really great but that gets in that'll get in the way of the of how Sibelius sets up hit points or markers. So what I would probably do is at the start of every system, but that's your taste. And again, if you're using Finale, you're gonna have to do a little research in how to do this in Finale. All right. I, I don't know that. I'm not a expert on notation software. I certainly can read and write music, but I spend most of my time sequencing and not uh, using Sibelius. I do know the basics of Sibelius. It's not a problem for me to create stuff, but I don't know the ins and outs of notation uh, software. So if you want to create a hit point, the first thing you'll need to do is to create some spotting notes, right? So for Loving Vincent, I just what I did was I created this little chart here that has every scene change. And the reason I did this is because it's a it's a trailer. So that means that the camera is going to be moving at a much faster rate than a regular film would because they want to get as much information into that 60 seconds as possible. So you want to show as many scenes and it's almost like it's a mini movie. It's like the 90 minute movie has been reduced down to one, uh, one minute. So you want to sort of pack as much stuff into there as possible. So that means that the scenes change practically every two or three seconds, there's a new scene. And it gives you this a false sense of excitement, but it's not going on for 90 minutes. It's just one, one minute. So it, it, it works in that, um, in that sense. So what I did was I just put in all of these scene changes. And when I work on the film, I'm going to choose the ones that I think are the most pertinent to my score because you don't have to catch every scene change, right? You just catch the ones that you, you'll see once we start working that 
you'll see that the f music has a pace and things will happen. And it, if you choose a good tempo, it will almost seem like that the, the music sort of works with the film. And I'll get into that in a second. But let me just show you how to add in these hit points. So let's make this a little bit small. And let's go up here. So, and also let me move this out of the way for the time being. So hit point, whoops, no, I don't want to do that. Create hit point. Oh no, it's no, it's we're gonna go to edit hit point. Sorry. Okay. So now they have this here set up in one hundredths. So you can't make this be in like quarter notes, right? And eighth notes and sixteenth notes. It really is a little bit of a drag, but you can make it work. So the first thing to do is you'll um, display and score uh, and you can select these and I'll show you that in a second, but new and right time code and then we're going to name this by just double clicking there and that will be film start. Hit OK and then the next one let's do night walk back of man right so I'm gonna do new and my time code is five so uh, let me just put this uh, I'll just put night walk And I'm just going to put a few of these in. So then let's see. The next one is, let's do 1201. Oh, I messed that up. Okay, let's do this again. Okay, so I put a few of those in, hit OK, and then notice that now it puts them in for you. Now, what you have to remember here, right, is the way that Sibelius is showing these. So, when you see something that says 3, 4, 58, right, that means bar 3, beat 4, and 58. Well, they're telling you that they're breaking the beat up into uh, 100 increments. So that's at about the second eighth note. That's all you really need to know. It doesn't have to be perfect for what you're doing. 7108, that's right on the downbeat. And this is at 120 beats per minute. You can, um, you could change the tempo, right? and put a new tempo in, whatever, and then that will all change. So let's... Uh, and then notice that I changed tempo and these all change. All right. So that's how you sort of work. And then you can start writing like you normally compose, right? So what I would do is I would go through and mark just like you would with, uh, with a DAW and get your markers in there because that's your structure. Okay. So that's a real quick look at how to do this inside of a notation program. Any question on that? You know, Sibelius... Uh, you oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Any idea, yeah, any idea how to do it on Finale? No, that you're going to have to look up. I don't know that. Um, if you're taking Mike's class, I think he knows how to do that because he uses Finale all the time. I n I've never used Finale in my life. 
So you're just going to have to Google that and look that up. I hate to be like that, but uh, there's only so much stuff that I can I can learn. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll do I'll I'll do a search, and if I find what I think is a good video, I'll post it up on our class stream uh, in the morning. All right, by tomorrow. So I'll do that for a finale. Okay, so what I was saying before is that with Pro Tools and with other DAWs, you can just resize this film and make it smaller. You can right click and change the size. I don't need to have it be that big while I'm working. This way I can just keep it up here. I have a second screen I can put it on, which is what I typically do when I'm working. But um, for now, this is fine. So now for the assignment, there are going to be um, three different tempi that uh, you can choose. You could choose, and I've written this in the assignment, you can choose either 60 beats a minute, 90 beats a minute, or 120 beats per minute. You're going to keep that tempo from the beginning to the end. You're not going to change the tempo. All right, I'm trying to make take away a lot of choices and just get you used to writing something and having the structure of what you're writing being affected by the film. The film is giving you the structure of what you're writing. I don't want you to have to worry about tempo changes if you're a little early or a little late with your hit. Don't worry about it. Just get it as close as you can. It'll all be fine. This is a good way to start. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, get my spotting notes here, right? And Let's do this. Let's make this a little bit smaller so we can see everything on one screen. All right, so night walk back in the man. So I can just type this in here. All right, and then I hit enter, and I'm going to keep my reference absolute. And then 12. All right, so I just type this in. 112, 01, enter, man smoking. Now, in Pro Tools, and I'm not sure how this is with the other DAWs, when you're putting in a memory location or a marker, right, it gives you a reference for the time properties. If you set it to bar and beat, if you're working and you want to change tempo, that's going to move on the timeline of the film where that marker is because the marker is referencing bar and beat. And let's say that this man smoking, it happens at 12 seconds, right? Well, at one at 90 beats a minute, that's about f bar five beat three. And at 120 beats a minute, that might be at bar three. So you want to make the reference absolute so that no matter what the tempo is, it will stay in the same spot in the timeline. Okay, so let's do um, Starry Night on Bay at 18, right? So I'm just picking the ones that I think, I've watched this a number of times, so, and then that's a new marker, and we'll make that absolute. Starty night on bay. And then there's this time thing in the film, which I'm I'm gonna make a choice, right? It's interesting because right after this, I'm just doing this frame by frame. You're gonna see that we've been in color the whole time, and then the middle section of this film is gonna go to black and white right here. And that's an interesting change. So the question is, do you want to capture that? Or what I think is interesting is this comes in and you just let it happen. And then there's right there, a man's hand, right? With a cigarette in it or a cigar or something like a, t like a skinny cigar. So I'm going to choose to capture that for right now. And then right there, you see how it changes to cobblestones. And then another interesting thing about the film is that at the, for the beginning of this film, 
a lot of the people that you see that you're focusing in on, the main focus of each of these little scenes, you're seeing them in the back. And then there is a, is a point where you start to see somebody at the beginning, it's somebody in the face. But most of what you see of people, there's quite a bit of you behind the person as they're walking or like here, you know, you're not seeing the person's face, you're seeing their feet. So it's all adds up to the same thing. So that's at 20, uh, 20, 10, and that's going to be a man's hand, B and W, and we'll make that absolute. And then the next big thing is at 2615. That's an altercation in a store. Altercation, is it altercation? Uh, altercation. And then 2901. Reveal in pub. Then there's thirty four twelve. Man with tear. And then 4112. So I'm not capturing everything. I'm just getting these broad strokes. I may change things. So 4112, pipe smoking. All this setup stuff, it seems pedantic and times can cost, you know, you should be writing, whatever. No. The writing goes so much quicker once you get the foundation. You know, most of you guys are jazz majors, uh, graduate jazz students, right? How much time do you spend learning a tune before you can really just let go and play it, right? You, there's a lot of preparation work that goes on. Okay, so let's see. So the next bit is 4623. And that's head turns and color starts. And the next bit is 5203. And then 54. I think I made a mistake. All right, let me just take a look at something here for a second. No, I have everything. Good. Okay. So you can see on my timeline here, I've got all of these. Let me just close this and make this a little. And maybe we don't need to see the outputs. Gives me a little bit more room and we don't need to see that. So I've got a little bit more room on my timeline here. 
right? You can see here on the timeline, I've got all these markers, they're color coded. And what's really cool about them is I put them in order. And um, what's great about that for on, on Pro Tools is that I can easily navigate back and forth using the keypad on the far right hand side. So if I do decimal point, one decimal point, it goes to the first marker. If I go decimal point, let's say five decimal point, it goes to the fifth one. And the way that you um, keep all these things straight is that there's a window called memory locations, right? Right here. And I, I often keep this open and on a side screen, and this way I can access this. So in other words, if I want to go to the pipe smoking, it's nine, dot, nine, dot, and there I am with the pipe smoking. So this really gives you a, a good way to navigate back and forth. And what's great about this is if you're playing the track and you quickly navigate, you play a few seconds of a section and then navigate to the next, like a few sections later, it, you can help balance with your mix because you can then see like, this, is that much louder than this next, than three sections later? It just helps you with balancing out the timeline volume wise when you're, when you're working. So, um, okay, so I'm going to save this. So constantly be saving. And I'm going to put this guy over here and get it out of the way. And let's put this guy up here and make him a little bit smaller or her a little bit smaller. And I no longer need this. All right, so let's talk about a setup, right? So I'm going to make this for a small chamber orchestra that's mostly strings with some key with pitched percussion and I've set up my Pro Tools session like this and you know this is beyond the scope of this class give me one sec here and when I teach this in person at the college I the, the I, I don't have I'm not able to really teach this so specifically because the classroom that I teach this in uh, typically only has a piano and the computers are not strong enough to run Pro Tools. It's, and if I run it in the lab, I can't play stuff on the piano when I'm playing you score excerpts. So it's sort of this um, bad compromise I have to make, which is why this class is actually better online because I have access to everything. So the way I've got this set up is I've got my pitched percuss percussion, which is piano, harp. I've got some Glock, some marimbas, Got some cymbaly stuff. And then I've got strings. So I've got solo violin, solo cello, and um, I've got spiccato. So then with my or string orchestra, I've got everything in sections, right? I'm not going to bother putting out individual uh, sections, but everything in ensembles, I mean, not individual sections. I've got, and I got it broken up by articulations. I like to work like this because it's very fast, and then I can separate things out later and put them into, into individual sections when I need to. Um, but there is something about an ensemble sound when you get these, some of these higher quality sample libraries that has a really nice glue to it because everybody's in the room at the same time. And uh, you just have to be careful with how many notes you play because it can get very thick very quickly. So I've got spiccato strings, some sustained strings. I've got consordino. I've got flotando, which is a very flutish. And then I've got pizzicato, coleño, which is bouncing the back. And then I've got the bass, and I do have a separate bass section for pizzicato. And then I've got reverb if I need extra reverb. And then I've got all my tracks, all, the outputs of all my tracks. Let me just show you this, right? Routed into this AUG send here, which I call music. And what this is good is this gives you one fader with which you can control all of the music. So if I had dialogue here, and I wanted to do a rough mix for a client when I was sending them uh, a demo uh, or you know a, a work, part of the work in progress. I can do a mix here and balance everything down against the dialogue, which would be on a separate track. 
So that's why it's really nice to have a separate, all the music routed into one, what I, what's called an AUGS track. And um, yeah, I teach this stuff in Audio MIDI 1. So um, pretty, pretty much in, pretty in depth. And then a couple of other things. I've got a master track and on the master track, I have an analyzer so I can see all my frequencies and everything. I have this up here in case I need to show you guys anything. I have on my desk right here an actual meter that this plug-in right here sends the same data to so I can just look at that screen on my desk there. So that makes it a little bit easier for me. To, I sort of mix as I'm going along and I want to make sure that my levels don't get higher than minus six on my peaks. And yeah, so um, there you go. So. Now, I've put this at 90 beats per minute, right? That's what I've chosen out of the three timings. So I'm going to start at, at measure zero, and I'm just going to play it, and I'm going to let the click track play along during the, during the playback. And then I'll be able to see how this tempo feels against the track. Three, four, boom. See, that's good. See that right on four, some of the stuff falls right on a beat, right? That's good. The head turn to color starts right on a downbeat. Four, boom. Right, so you would end before the blackout and let the ring, the, the sound fade out. So let's take a listen to that. At uh, sixty, right, and see how it feels. You can just see the difference. See, look how that, uh, two, happens right there it's one two three four boom so they both end in a nice spot you notice that there were more things that hit on a downbeat at 60 beats per minute uh, let me play uh, 120 and um, I'll, I'll discuss the differences Yeah, this one, you'd have to end it like a little bit before the script finished. Okay, so 
the question becomes, how do you pick your tempo, right? Well, let me just start playing along at the various tempos, right? So let me start, I'll start with 60. And I'll just improvise some stuff. And maybe I'll come in at measure two so that I can, um, give me one second here. That had a certain kind of feel, right? I was playing mostly 16th notes. And actually, it, it, I might change my mind and go back to 60 beats a minute instead of 90 because I liked the way that I didn't mind the way that that flowed. But let's start at 90 beats per minute. Uh, let's go to 90 beats per minute and I'll. Uh, this one I can start a little early, so let's do this. So, one, two, three. So that one has a little bit of a different feel to it, right? It's sort of um, interesting because I think that if I were to play eighth notes in that uh, four and let me change a different key. I'm getting sick of C. That has a different kind of a feel to it. Let's try 120. Thank you. 
little twisted and demented there. So you can sort of um, see what changing the tempo actually can do to the music, right? It can really change everything because it affects your rhythmic values, it affects the feel, it affects certain things. So for example, if I'm playing along, if I'm writing something and it's, I'm at 120, right? If I wanted to give a feel like I was changing the time signature, right? I can do figures like I can do I can break things down into groups of three and two and then you know figure out where the downbeat is down the road somewhere and, I, and so you can get some really interesting subdivisions without changing the time signature at all by how you how you sort of structure all that so but for me I think 120 is a little frenetic for this but you choose what tempo you want 90 is okay but I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to change this again and go back to, um, let me just uh, look at one thing first. Uh, my memory locations, where are they? There they are. Yeah, okay, I don't have these all set up correctly. So I had this set up for 90 beats, oops. Right, for 90 beats a minute. That means that I, I have a nice, I can get my count in, and it's at the same tempo. If I put this at one at 60, say, oh, actually, it does work. Oh, it's fine, never mind. So I might, I might want to try six, something at 60, right? All right, so in the first nine seconds, what's the what's the common thing in, in all of that, all of those, all that footage? There's one element common in all of them. There's people walking? Yeah, well, not here. There's no people walking. A train? Correct. And notice that, like, the train is traveling right so you're here out in the country you're going over a river it's at night and then there at measure nine right that's that's um the first time you don't see the train so that's interesting i i just thought of that now so that may affect my mark where i put my markers so again I've got these in here now. I can just slide these over and move them and rearrange them. So in other words, let's just do this. So, okay. So let me just, I'm just holding down the plus key and I can scroll frame by frame. Three, it starts right after um, the downbeat of three. So I, if I hit on, on three, it'll be fine. So I could take this and move this over to here, right? And then I can rename that um, a no train or something. So now instead of having to capture all those things, I just need to get from here to three, four, two, two and three and four and boom right so i need to come up with eight eight beats and i'm going to want to play i want to have i think with this piece for the beginning of this one thing i think i want to get established is this isn't a kind of piece that's going to start off like this um this wouldn't really work that well
Right. Because it's it's like it's a first of all it's a trailer and it's moving. Every like this train is motion and it almost feel and even the train is moving but also the picture is moving. Right? So let's, let's let me show you what I mean. It's like you got a drone and you're moving in on the train. Right here it's a little static, but here like you're moving in under the bridge and you're moving here along with the guy. So like those first two of those first three, well, three of those first four frames, the, the picture is the, like the point of view is actually moving along. So I think that you want to sort of capture that a little bit, right? And I, I'm going to, I'd like for this piece, I think I want to have a keyboard. Um, I want to have something that moves that along. So let's start, let me just start noodling around. That's okay. I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to go crazy with this stuff. I'm just going to go with whatever I improvise. So let me create something that's a little bit more interlocking with the harp, right? I've got a harp here. So I'm just going to rock. I don't, I'm whatever. like that up until this point here. See, this gets in the way here. Let me make this small and get it the heck out of my face. Yeah, I don't like it there. So what I like to do is uh, I just like to put something called MIDI merge recording and then I can start and measure before here and just punch in when I want to and it won't erase what's happening before. So let me just play this. Okay, so I know what I'll play there. Okay, cool. And let's let's um, I'm gonna add some bottom so the dance lever just can't hide. Yeah, that's that'll be good. Two and three and four and So what did I do here? Well, first thing is that I like to not always have music on the downbeat, right? Where do I get that from? I get that from Afro-Cuban music, right? Tumbayos. They don't always hit on the downbeat. They emphasize the middle of the measure, reggae. A lot of music that I've been influenced by. So it's kind of interesting to sort of pop that into a little chamber piece. Two, three right on beat three, one, two, and three. Right, the last six, and then here, bit boom, bit boom. So I'm, I'm in D major, right? I'm starting a D major, and then I go to this B flat, this little ascending thing right here, and this changes with this guy here. So I make it a little bit more busy, and the bass is now going, instead of one figure per measure, it's going two figures per measure, right? So I'm sort of like moving things along with the music and with the story, right? So already it's taking shape, right? I'm just noodling around. Obviously, I've seen this film, like I've been teaching with this for a while and I've seen it many times. Um, so I'm pretty much know what's happening in the film, but 
and let me get this click so that it doesn't play. It only plays during record. I don't need to hear it. And always save as you're working. So right on that downbeat there, I can do something a little bit um, very subtle. So let's just go on. Almost. And that's too loud, so I'm going to turn the volume down. And I'm going to do that with uh, MIDI expression. I usually teach my students to edit in the MIDI editor, but right now I'm just going to rock the uh, on the edit page there. Okay, so right there at that point, I want to do something. But let's just see what we've got so far. Hmm, that wouldn't be bad either. Okay, so just for you guys' edification, um, instrumentalists animate their sound. Right? They all animate their sound. When you talk, you animate their sound. If I did not animate my voice, I would sound like a machine. But I have different cadences. I leave pauses. I talk a little louder. I talk a little softer. Right? So every instrumentalist, especially string players, animate. They've got their fingers on the string and they've got their hands on the bow and they can control the pressure of the bow to change the dynamics they can do vibrations with their left hand you know they can all sorts of amazing stuff the same with anybody who's got their mouth on a horn right you can do all sorts of stuff in real time and when you are sequencing to make you have to do that it adds so much life to the music and with the more expensive sample libraries, and what you guys would do is you would do this with MIDI volume, but they what they do is they uh, on your on the cheaper ones like the BBC Discover. Um, I went over a little bit of that last week. What they have these programmed so that you um, use the mod mod wheel, which is MIDI CC one, and the mod wheel is the that bit on your key, but one of the the uh, it's the second from the left wheel on your most keyboards. So um, I have it set up on this controller here. And what it does is it not only gets louder, it gets more intense, right? So it's so if I were to just do that with like volume, That's just getting louder. It's not cha changing the intensity. So that's soft. You can hear how it gets much more intense. And also you can change the vibrato as well using a different controller and then move it down into tremolo. Right, so you program these things in when you're playing and it makes it sound more, more real. It just gives more life and interest to your music. Interesting. Pro Tools, you're killing me today didn't get my see so I didn't get my Glock that's okay so what I want to do is uh, let's see I think that that came in a no train okay one more time
Great. And then let's uh, save that. Let's get my ugly mug back up in the corner. Let's go down to our solo violin. And this is another thing, right? When I make my ensembles, I have different size ensembles. So I've got a chamber string ensemble, and I've got a couple of solo, vi solo violin and solo cello. So this adds a lot of interest to your orchestrations. So let's... Uh All right, now I'm going to do something with the vibrato. All right, so um, now I've got this on MIDI merge or might be like MIDI overdub on some other DAWs. This means I can record with like all those controllers without erasing the MIDI data. change something there. Let's see what beat is that going to be. So, one, two, three, four. So right on the downbeat, I think, of this next measure is close enough. I mean, it's one, two, three, and so it's on the, wait, wait, let's, let me try. One, two, three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and so if I come in on the end of three with something there, that could work, or I could come in right on four so that it's a little bit afterwards. So I think that that's what I'm going to do there. I think what I'll do is I'm going to make that a measure of three, four. So you could change time signatures. Um, the other thing, though, is that let me just see. Let me uh, solo the piano and hit. Uh, well, actually, let me do this. Three and four and one and two and three and four. Yeah, I think I'm going to make that a measure of three, four. So my meter is going to be 3, 4. Now, you don't have to do this. You do this your own way. One, two, three, one. So it comes in. I'm going to have something that comes in, and then I'm going to go back to 4 on the next measure. Well, let me think about that for a second. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one. No, actually, I'm going to have right there. I'm going to go back to four, four there. Okay, so watch, watch what I've done here. Let me turn the click back on. All right, so I'm figuring out my structure. So I'm in four, four, one, two, three, Four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. See that his hand gets right in the middle of the screen at that at that downbeat there. So I think that that works really well, even though it's a little bit after his um, uh, entrance of the hand there. I, I like that that pacing there. So let me just think, what can I do there for him? So go. Try something like that. Two, three, four, and oh, sorry. Whoa, I came in too early. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Nope, don't like that. One, 
two, three. Yeah, okay, so that's okay. Keep on counting four in my head. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Yeah, I like that. That's kind of cool. Let me play that a little better. Two, three, four. One, two, three. So this, you can see this is taking taking shape, right? Let's uh, add a little bit. Oh, darn it. One, two, three. Uh, one more time. Two, three, one and two and three and one and two and three and. All right, so let's listen back without me counting. All right, let's see what we can fit with the harp. the sound of the harp up there. Turn up the volume on that and listen to it. Okay, so I'm going to edit that, right? So the first thing we do is uh, go to slip mode and make this a little bit longer. And I'm going to use, go here to mod wheel, and I'm going to fade that note out a little bit. and we'll help that along with uh, expression as well. Ba -do -da -ba -da. Yeah, and this can hang over. That's fine. And let's do this. 
I could play that in, but I can also draw it in really quickly. And let's add some vibrato work with that. All right, save that. the note there. All right, so this is, let me make this one a little bit different. So this is, so I can move this up to a C. These notes were the same. the repetition nope do not like do not like. Right, so normally you couldn't have, you know, the strings, low strings and the cellos and doing the pizzicatos and the high strings doing those spiky things and then who would be doing the coleno, but you know, these are sampled instruments, I can do what I want. <laughs> So that's okay. Let me um, do something here. Let me show you. So to, when I was playing this, in order to keep the time, I played. Let me mute those. See, that fits much better. Okay, I'm halfway done with my final. <laughs> so, any questions on what I'm doing here? Anything you want me to explain? I'm just trying to just demo like how I work when I score a film, right? This is basically what I do. I just jam in the box. I obviously, you know, you guys, you know, don't have keyboard skills probably, but however you compose, right? You got to just try ideas out and look 
and and put together a narrative. And I've got enough material here now, you know, and where I've you know really sort of set up the way that the that this particular uh, cue sounds. Like you can really get a sense of the sonic architecture I'm using, right? I might actually think about adding a few more instruments. Maybe there'd be I could add a, a like some wind instruments or a French horn or something like that. You can make an electronic score if you want. I, I don't care. You can do a jazz score if you want. Whatever you want, realize it and just make it work with this film, you know? Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. So just, you know, that's about 40 minutes worth of work to get about 30 seconds worth of, of music. And I could sit there and once I get through the whole piece, I, I'll go back and clean things up. And it's like, you know, you got clay on a pottery, on a wheel, you know, as it's going down, you're shaping it, you're shaping it, you keep shaping it until you never get finished. But there's a deadline, you have to hand it in. That's the other part about doing this. So um, anyway, I'm going to put this away for the time being and we're going to go back to our survey because there's some st other stuff I want you to listen to today unless we've got some oh Matthew so love how you morphed into piano into string setting using the cello and pizzicato figure right so you know that's one of my big things when I teach in any of my classes even when I teach my MIDI classes when people are doing work you know I like the orchestrate I like things to move forward Right, and there's many ways to make your move, music move forward. You can do it with rhythm, um, but you can also do it through orchestration. You know, and and that's one of my big things is that when I listen to a lot of young composers, they are really, especially on YouTube, people that you know do this kind of music, they're really good with the technical stuff, but they don't their orchestrational skills are banal at best. You know, they, they stay on one thing. And also the other thing to do that drives me up the freaking wall is they'll have like a wind instrument playing for um, two minutes without taking a breath, you know? Um, um, yeah. I was just going to ask professor. So like, are there any, um, are there any like exercises or, or like, a, like some kind of assignment or something you can like give, for us to like practice orchestrating or like something that you can show us to like or show me <laughs> i'm showing you right now with that. i'm showing you right well, now yeah pass the peas that's true. there's that's a great song that i love by fred <laughs> wellesley and james brown um pass the peas just you know you you just i'm going to be going over that i'm, I'm going to be doing more of this next week you know as we go forward but just listen to how real film composers do this stuff listen to how ravel orchestrates listen to you know his, his orchestration of pictures at an exhibition. It's unbelievable lesson in how to, uh, colors and everything. Listen to Stravinsky, you know, another incredible orchestrator. These are, are, are like amazing orchestrators. Um, you know, I got this stuff because I spent half my life in a Broadway pit. And, you know, a lot of the music I had to play for a living, while I'm very thankful for the work, um, let's say that some of the music wasn't so great. But what kept it interesting was the way that these orchestrators, people like Bill Braun, um, the late Bill Braun, it was a great guy. I, I've known him since 1984. It was the first show I played that he did the orchestrations for when he did a summer show at Radio City Music Hall. And I was in the pit orchestra there for, it was 13 week uh, run. Um, he was constantly, every two or three, four bars, passing things around all these, you know, and, and all the different instrument groups. So, you know, let's say, for example, there was a keyboard part playing something like, um, this is one of the songs from Miss Saigon, right? So this is the piano part for one section of the song. Right, so it's like Moonlight Sonata, right? And just B, B to B augmented, then E, F sharp. So what he would do is like, if I'm playing like this, there might be flute, then oboe, 
playing a counterline, then then uh, clarinet, then in unison, right? So like every couple, like he's pl- do da di da 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 da. Like so, if there's a right, so that first time might be flute, then the second time on the oboe, and then on the last time on the oboe and flute and then maybe uh, these are counter lines behind the melody the vocal thing that last one might be clarinet it might be an octaves with a clarinet right so basically like every two bars he's, he's changing the uh, accompaniment figure behind well the, the, the counter melody behind the, uh, the, the vocal line so you know I, I all all the big orchestr- orchestrators on Broadway that's one of the key things they do and that's sort of um, you play that music for <laughs> all, all those different shows for 30 years and that sort of seeps into your creative consciousness but basically you know a lot of what I've done is experimentation and I just work at it you know um, what I would say for you guys is to come up with an ensemble, you know, six, eight, ten instruments, four instruments, and try to figure out creative ways to make those sounds unfold, right? So, for example, I've got a string section, right? And I've got spiccato, which I use for those spiky chords. There's consordino, which may come up, that's muted. There's this flautando, right? And that's pizzicato, colino, and those are different articulations that you can use. So, you know, I do believe if you have the uh, Discover library that they've got a fair amount of articulations for the strings, Um, although they don't have ensemble patches, they have sectional patches. So you'd have to write a little bit differently than I'm doing here. But if you use something like that, and again, you don't have to use orchestral instruments for your score. You can use whatever your heart desires. It's your, your, you know, it, I'm leaving that up to you, but you got to sell me on the idea when to listen to it, you know. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Is that helpful, Matt? Definitely. That was, yeah, that was very helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I have to do a lot of my own, I think, studying and um, like looking at other composers. Correct. You know, when you're traveling, listen to film music on your iPod, on your phone. You know, just put your headphones on and listen to film music and just listen for the orchestrations. It's a big part of what they do. It's it's so much so that there are separate orchestrators in films. Okay, so let's get let's put this away for the time being. I'll come back to this next week. <laughs>